And might we declare it and demonstrate it to you in worship, to one another in fellowship, and to the world in mission. These gifts we give today, we give for that purpose, that your name might be glorified. In Jesus' name and for his glory we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you. Glad you're all here today. Um, it's been a good day uh, so far just seeing everybody fellowship and come in anticipating hearing from God and, and doing God's work. We, we had that last night. It was a wonderful time of, of wrestling with some, some very difficult truths and the message I'm about to share with you. I'm going to be very upfront and honest. I, it might be a difficult one for some of you. Um, we'll get there in a minute, but, um, but w- what we just prayed, we really do believe that we've been called to declare and demonstrate the transforming power uh, of this wonderful gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And and we as a church uh, structure ourselves so that more and more people, more and more people can experience that in any number of different ways, that, that God's uh, power would be seen in the resurrection of Jesus and that they would come to a saving knowledge of him. This last weekend, uh, uh, Friday night uh, and Saturday, our board and uh, our pastors uh, got together for our annual board retreat where we just did some time of reflecting um, some time of strategizing, some time of dialogue and discussing, and uh, it was really, really great. It was hard. There was uh, disagreements, um, but there was unity because we're all passionate about that thing that we've been called to declare and demonstrate the transforming power of the gospel, and we believe in the power of the church to deliver that good news. Over the next few weeks and months, um, we're going to continue to talk with you uh, about the next steps for us as a church, something we introduced back in the summer. Um, we're looking forward to our AGM where we will uh, vote on whether to move in that direction. Um, in the meantime, we just want to talk. We want to have that dialogue. And so uh, a few of us will be coming and hopefully visiting uh, some of your life groups or your small groups. Uh, we'd also be happy to come and meet you in your homes to talk about the future of the church, to pray and dialogue and discuss together what God might be doing. We had a question yesterday uh, after a whole bunch of other questions, do you sense God is doing something in your midst? And everyone around the table said yes. And I know that that's where my heart is. I know that's where many of your hearts are. Our job is to discern where that's going and be proper stewards of it. I came back from vacation a few weeks ago, <clears throat> and uh, uh, I always I like coming back from vacation because um, I miss everybody. That's a good that's a good feeling for a pastor. And I walked in the door, and you've noticed that we've got these TVs that kind of have announcements on them and different things, right? Because uh, uh, that's what we do these days. Uh, and uh, this, this slide came up, this SCC slide that said, welcome home. Uh, and I was like, oh, thanks, man. <laughs> I went up to Nathan. I'm like, you made that slide just for me? And he's like, uh, no. Isn't that a wonderful sentiment? It really is. And uh, it, it, it speaks to what we really aspire to be. We aspire to be a family. We aspire for this to be home. Now, we all know that no family is perfect, right? Anybody from the perfect family? Kids, raise your hand. My kids are not here, obviously, because we're not the perfect family, I guess. And no family is perfect. In fact, family is messy. This statement, to be welcomed home, takes a great deal of faith to believe. Because we carry with us a certain level of baggage that comes from our relationships. For many of us, uh, we've had good relationships and we've had bad relationships. Some of you have come from good homes. Many of you have come from not so good homes. You know the hurt that, that all kinds of relationships can, can cause between husband and wife, between mother and daughter, between father and son, between brother and sister, between friend and between friend. So this statement, believing this, that we are being welcomed home, is a faith-filled statement. And we're not going to live in denial that that SCC has gotten there, but this is what we aspire to be. Now, in order to do that, we reject, we reject all identifiers that separate us. We live in a culture that says the individual is the absolute. The individual is the absolute, and what an individual decides is true. Now, the problem with that is that that conflicts with everybody else who is an individual. 
That's why we see tension between genders, between sexuality, between race, between religion. What we need, and we've talked about this in the past, is a, is a greater identifier, an absolute identifier that allows us to live in freedom, freedom of how God created us to be. That identifier we read about in Genesis 2, that God created us in the image of him, be loved by him through our relationships with one another. This gets broken. It was broken because of sin, and it's a tension that many of us wrestle with today. And it causes this statement to require sometimes just a little bit too much faith. Today we're going to talk about relationships, and I'm going to invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 25. This is where we see a transition of generations. Uh, last week, um, we... Uh, I unpack the story of Isaac and Rebecca by really going spiritual, looking at the things that were happening that may uh, be in the sky and how God works. Today, I want to get very, uh, le- le- what is the word I'm looking for? Human. <laughs> Some of the human realities uh, that, that this story portrays. There isn't a whole lot there at first glance, but there is a lot more there once we dig into it a little bit. Um, and so, uh, here we see the beginning of Isaac's story. And what I want you to see is, is that in Genesis 25, he goes through some, some very critical stages in his life uh, in growing up. Uh, I have a very conflicted relationship about being a grown-up. Um, I don't want to be one anymore. You know? Yeah. Uh, and there's times where, where uh, I really enjoy being a grown-up, and then I think this is, there's other times where it's just not so fun. The truth is, is that we can't avoid it. Uh, but the truth is, is that God is faithful at every one of those stages if we're willing to listen and let him guide us. I want you to look for the stages in this story. And you can be looking for them as I try uh, to read many, many difficult names, okay? And so you're allowed to chuckle and giggle all you want. And then uh, we're going to actually pass it all around. And anybody who wants to give a shot at some of these names uh, can come forward. We'll happily hand over the mic. Genesis 25, verse 1, Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Midan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan fathered Sheba and Dedan. The sons of Dedan were Asherim, Letushim, Lemun. The sons of Midian were Ephah, Epher, Hanok, Abida, Eldah. All these were the children of Keturah. Abraham gave all he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts. And while he was still living, he sent them away from his son, eastward to the east country, his son Isaac. These are the days of the years of Abraham's life, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, a man full of years, and was gathered to his people. Underline that for just a second or circle that. That's beautiful. Uh, Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man full of years, and was gathered to his people. Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, east of Mamre, the field that Abraham purchased from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with Sarah, his wife. After the death of Abraham, God blessed his son Isaac and settled at Beer Lahai Roy. These are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's servant, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the son of Ishmael, named in order of their birth. Neboeth, the firstborn of Ishmael, Kedar, Ab- Adbil, Nibsan, Mishma, Duma, Massa, Hadad, Hima, Jeter, Naphish, Kitama. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names. By their villages and by their encampments, 12 princes according to their tribes. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. He breathed his last and died, and he was gathered to his people. They settled from Havilah to Shur, which is opposite Egypt in the direction of Assyria. He settled over against all his kinsmen. Okay. You see it? <laughs> Whew. Ben finally got a genealogy. All right. Sarah's died, and Abraham, it says, takes another wife. Uh, There's a bit of discussion and dialogue about when this happened. Um, uh, We're not going to get into that today. All we do know is that he took another wife and had more sons. Uh, It uh, it, uh, is part of Abraham's legacy. Uh, The rest of Genesis, though, is concerned about Abraham uh, and his son Isaac and his son Jacob and so on and so forth. And so we're going to follow that line today. Uh, We're going to follow that story today because it ties in very directly with the New Testament. 
Abraham's last years were peaceful and they were full of God's blessing. And that's why I highlighted for you um, those words uh, at Genesis uh, 25, where he says that he breathed his last and died in a good old age. We know that he had blessed, God had blessed Abraham in all things. And what I want us to see here is that the point is that God is always faithful to his promises, that he is trustworthy. We could go back and look at all of those promises and see them uh, either partially fulfilled or completely fulfilled uh, in this passage that God was trustworthy, that God was uh, doing what he said he would do. And he said, I will bless you and I will bless all nations through you. Uh, he says, I will give you a land. And even though that that wasn't going to happen for another 400 years, uh, in as far as the Israel becoming a nation, he was buried there. He did have a place there. In Genesis 15, uh, God promises that he would have a son with his wife, Sarah, um, uh, who was barren at the time. And in that same chapter, he says that Abraham will die at an old age. Now, that's, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, if God tells you when you're going to die, old or young. Uh, I wasn't planning on talking about that, so we won't. Uh, I'm sure we'll get back to it at some point along the way. The point is this. God, when God makes a promise, it always comes to pass. This is the example that Abraham gives to Isaac. This is the example that Abraham gives to Isaac, and Isaac becomes a man of God. He's going through various stages of life. In this passage, we read that he buries his father. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we read that he moves. We read that he uh, has uh, a, a broken relationship with his brothers, that he is alone to establish his own family. It says that he moves to Beer Lehe Roy. That tells me that he's a man of God because that was the place where God always kept showing up and talking. That's where he spoke to Hagar. Uh, that was likely the place where he went to meditate before the servant came back with Rebecca. Uh, Isaac was a man of God and wanted to hear God's voice and move to the very place where that was. Uh, we see all of these stages come to pass, and then later on in the chapter, uh, he has his own stuns, and Isaac uh, becomes a grown-up. Isaac becomes a grown-up. He's been given this example by his father, but, but an example is only one part uh, of the process of becoming a man. Uh, he needs to live it out. And we will see that he does that uh, successfully and unsuccessfully. Uh, that's what I love about Genesis is none of these uh, men or women are put up as models for us. Uh, sometimes they do the right thing. Sometimes they do the wrong thing. Something that I can relate to. Both of those things point us to Jesus. I'm reading this book right now uh, about friendship. Uh, and uh, in it, the author says, uh, I have two types of personality. One is Jesus and one is Hitler. You know? And I mean, they were talking on both extremes, right? Abraham's example to his son Isaac wasn't what it meant to be a good man. What it was was meant to show him what a godly man was. What a godly man was. And at the point of his death, Ab Isaac now had point of Abraham's death, Isaac now has to live into what his father uh, showed him. And he's going to do it successfully in some cases and unsuccessfully in others. The first thing is that he buries his father. It was um, 10 years ago, uh, this actually yesterday, uh, that my wife buried her father. He wasn't very old. He was in his 50s, and I'm realizing 10 years later that that's not very old. Uh, he was a good man. You know how you go to some funerals? And, um, and I've heard people say it this way. I, I go to people's funerals, and I learn about who they were. You know, Sometimes I go to funerals, and, and I hear what's said about a person, and I go, I don't think that's who you're talking about. <laughs> it's like we got to kind of make these people into saints at their death. My father-in-law, uh, I said that on that day, was a very, very good man. Nothing flashy, not charismatic, faithful. Loved his family, was generous. We sang on that day, uh, It Is Well With My Soul. Kirsten played it on the piano. Uh, I didn't sing it. Neither did she. Because it wasn't. It wasn't well with our soul. Not in the sense of in this sense, in that 
we were wrestling with the reality of death who took someone we loved away. It was well with our soul in that in those moments we knew there was no wound. There was no hurt. That we'd had our chance to say goodbye. We'd had our chance to be united. It took a disease that was very, very quick um, to take his life, but not so quick that we didn't have a chance to talk about some things and to plan some things. The question I want to ask, which is a very, very deeply personal question, is this. Are you ready to bury your dad? Now, I know many of you have already done that. And you may have had the unfortunate experience where there were things left unsaid, and that wound, that wound still festers and it still hurts and has yet to heal. You know what it's like to say goodbye to somebody and not have, not have peace with them. You know what that's like. For those of you who are in the room who don't know what it's like to bury a parent, I want you to take into consideration the testimony of others who have either had the chance to make peace with their dad, with their mom, or haven't. And take very seriously that relationship. The father wound is a deep wound. And rarely a week goes past that I don't meet somebody who is really struggling with it. Many people have a hard time articulating a lot of things come back to that place. And so when I say, are you ready to bury your dad? What I'm saying is this. Do you have healing and reconciliation in that relationship? Have you pursued it? Have you pursued it believing that God can heal it? A few years ago this time, I was um, in India with my dad. And um, <clears throat> I, I realized there's a time in every man's life when you, you realize your dad is human. Do you know that? Right? Yeah, uh, there's, my kids learned it very, very young. Uh, uh, for me, I was a little older, but I remember distinctly, and I'm not going to tell you that story. Um, but I, I learned very later on that, that my dad was human, and when that, that was a light bulb experience, and, and I realized our relationship had shifted a little bit to become more like, uh, I don't want to say a peer relationship, but kind of like a peer relationship. Um, we went to India together, and um, it, it was really great. Um, my favorite day was a day when we woke up uh, on uh, the beach in, next to the Indian Ocean in the, in the Goa part of India. And my dad said, I'd like to go geocaching today. And my dad does geocaching. You know what geocaching is? It's basically grown-up scavenger hunts. And he nerds out on this stuff, right? And, and uh, we, <laughs> uh, we often go out and we just follow him around looking for little tiny things in places. And I just think, why is this fun? This is not fun looking for tiny things in small places in the middle of nowhere, and he's got his GPS. And anyways, yeah, he, uh, we'd had a good trip, and so I was cool with that. Um, so we talked to our waiter who said, hey, man, where did we get some scooters? He said, just hold on a second. No word of a lie. Five minutes later, two guys were there with two scooters and a helmet. They gave them to us. We didn't sign anything. We gave them 100 rupees, about $20, and we had them for the day. Okay? Now, we are riding these scooters. It's nuts in India. It's crazy. Right? It's basically the rule of the road is this. You need to be first. Whoever is in front has the right of way. Okay? Doesn't matter. Lines on the road don't matter. Traffic signs don't matter. Police don't matter. All that stuff doesn't matter. And we spent the day having a great time bombing around on these little scooters once we kind of figured it out. Um, we went a long ways away from our hotel. Like along, in the middle of nowhere. And it was a great adventure. We found our last geocache, um, which... Uh, was a success, uh, and then we were heading back uh, on this highway, and we were trying to get there past sunrise, uh, but before sundown. Uh, my dad was ahead of me because that's what he does. Uh, he just goes. Um, it's kind of, I do that too. Um, very impatient. Let's just go. Uh, and but I had been riding. Okay, here's another. I had been riding without a helmet for a little while. Oh, give me a break. Okay, all the whatever. Um, but I realized we were heading onto the highway, so I stopped to put on my helmet. At that point, I lost my dad. Um, at that point, I got lost myself. But I'm a grown-up, so I just kept going south. And I just figured, I'll finally find my, my place. I'll find out where uh, the hotel is. And I did that. It took me a while. I never saw him again. 
I got to the hotel. I went and sat on the beach, got myself a drink. I put my feet up, and my dad wasn't there. And so I waited for him, and I waited for him, and I waited for him. This is where I'm starting to think, who's the father and the son in this situation, right? And I was just like, no, he's my dad. He'll figure it out. He eventually gets there. And what had happened was, was uh, he pulled off to wait for me at some point. And because we, there's no sides of the road, that there's no people going this way and this way, it's just kind of, he stopped on one side and I passed him on the other side. And he had actually gone back to town and he talked to the police and he'd been looking for me and he'd been worried. And, and he comes back and I'm sitting there on the beach with a drink. Hey man, where you been? And, uh, and he, this is when I remembered that my dad was my dad. He was simultaneously furious and deeply loving in relief. It was great. Are you ready to bury your dad? Do you know that he's still your father? This might mean for you exploring again, exploring again that relationship. This might mean not being able to talk to your father directly, but be able, being able to talk to your God, your father, about your father. And making sure that that wound is healed by Christ through the power of forgiveness. I think that's an important thing to explore. We're going to pursue that a little bit more, but I want to talk about another relationship for a second, too, because there's another, another set of relationships in this passage, the relationship between Isaac and Ishmael. Um, this is... Uh, this is a tragedy that happens, their story is a tragedy that happens in many stories. There's a favorite son and a not favorite son. Isaac was the favorite son. Ishmael, Ishmael was the bastard son. Now, Abraham loved his son Ishmael. Abraham prayed for his son Ishmael. Abraham prayed that, prayed that God would bless this son. Uh, but he knew that, that God's blessing in birthright, his blessing in the nation, in the land, in the blessing in being blessed so that he can bless the whole world would come through Isaac uh, when one day by giving us uh, a Messiah, giving us a Redeemer. That created tension between these two brothers. Isaac moves. He moves to the place where God speaks. Ishmael, Ishmael moves closer to Egypt. The sons of Keturah, they move east. You see the family divide. You see, see the family divide. And there isn't reconciliation. Ishmael dies. It doesn't say that Isaac went to his funeral. I'm kind of doubting that he did. In fact, we know that those brothers had enough tension that it extended into the next generation and into the next generation and into the next generation. To this day, the Arabs, the offspring of Ishmael and the Jews, the offspring of Isaac, still have tension over a land. The Arabs. And if you read Ishmael's son's names, they sound very Arab. That's what happened. That relationship never healed. Now for us as individuals, we, we need to recognize that what's going on globally actually has a very personal significance within our family. That there needs to be the possibility of reconciliation in all of our relationships. And that we make ourselves available for that. Sometimes it doesn't work out that way. There's a phrase that I often like to use. Um, when someone brings a problem to me, uh, especially when it's in these, in these kind of cases, I say this, well, it is what it is. Did anybody say that? It is what it is. Now, I use it in two different ways. I use it as an excuse, first off. I'm not going to get involved in this. It is what it is, right? Because um, sometimes to probe into these things, into these issues means conflict. And I don't like conflict. I don't know many people who do like conflict, but my way of getting out of conflict is to use that phrase and as an excuse, it is what it is. On the other hand, there is a more positive, positive. There is a more surrendered way of using that phrase. It is what it is. I believe this. I believe the Christian should always be open to the possibility of reconciliation. Some of us, some of us want to force that. The work of reconciliation belongs to God and not to us. That's why when I look at this story and everything that has happened in the history of the world since, the only way reconciliation will happen between these two races is 
as if God does it. And we believe that God will do it. And we need to be ready when God does it. The same way we need to be ready when God does it in our relationships with one another. When we're open to the possibility of reconciliation, we do so as a faith action. Sometimes, though, our pursuit of that, we become very manic. and We go, I've got to fix this relationship. Why won't this person just fix it? And we think because we're never wrong that if we just fix them, then it'll all be good. And that's what we're doing for the wrong reason. Our job is to remember Christ in this whole story. That if this is God's work, that if reconciliation is God's work, then we make ourselves available to that possibility. What that means, what that means is this. We confess and reject the sin of forgivelessness. I just made up a new word. It's a good word, forgivelessness. Abraham died knowing that things were not going to get much easier for his son. That, that his trials would be different than his own, but he died believing that, that God was a God who was doing a work and that that was a powerful work of, of redemption and reconciliation. And Jesus talks about Abraham in John chapter 8. Jesus talks about Abraham and says, Abraham looked forward to my day, to see my day. He saw it and he was glad. Now, the context of that passage in John 8 um, uh, is that the Jews, the Pharisees, um, were being challenged by Jesus as to who their true father was and what made them unique and what they were identifying with. They decided that Abraham was their father. And Jesus said, well, God needs to be your father. And if you were a true child of Abraham, God would be your father. And he was challenging their greatest identifier. See, what they had done is they had chosen that because God had blessed Abraham and that they were children of Abraham, that they were somehow special because they were distinct. And that feeling of distinction and that feeling of superiority allowed them to be justified in both their racism and their isolation. They even called Jesus, they call him two words. Just before uh, he says these words about Abraham, they call him a Samaritan and call him demon-possessed. They use a racial slur and basically call him a child of Satan. Why? Because he was challenging them to believe that God was their father. Isn't that really good news? Not for them. Not for them because he says your isolation has broken your relationships and has diminished the power of God in your life. And what they had forgotten, what they had forgotten was this was that they were blessed of God for a reason. What was that reason? To bless the whole world. How did that happen? Jesus. How did that happen? Jesus. So that everyone could know the possibility of having God as Father. Instead, instead they chose to identify with something that was a lesser identifier than God as Father. They chose to identify with their religion and call themselves special. This is what happens in varying degrees when we refuse to forgive somebody. We step out of the will of God and instead define ourselves by our hurt. We identify with our individuality and we know that because we've isolated ourselves. We've withdrawn. And we look around at those people who have hurt us and we say, they're the problem. I have a long list of people who have hurt me. I was convicted last night when I said that, that I'm sure there's a long, even longer list of people I've hurt. In the middle, I need Jesus. I need the forgiveness of Christ to let me let go of, of that hurt. Sometimes we come into worship. We come into this building and, and uh, we cringe when it's time for coffee. Because that means we have to talk to somebody else. And, you know, we're worried about people getting to know us and worried about getting to know people and all of the implications of that. And we really just want to be left alone. And we just want to sit by ourselves and, 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 and not really be in a family and the welcome home thing. Like, that's a little weird. Pastor Ben, 
you know, and because we've got these hurts and, and we've taken them and we've wrapped our fist around them. And then we come into church and we get engaged in relationships and what God does is he's trying to pull that fist open. Remember how strong my kids were when they had something they shouldn't have, right? When a two-year-old has a marble, that's bad news. Right? And it's in that fist and you realize how strong those fists are. And that's what we do. We take our hurts and we put them in a closed fist. And we're so focusing all of our attention and our energy on this that we're not actually releasing our hands so that we can receive healing. And that that's really what it means to be a child of God. That's really what it means to be blessed of God. Jesus was the fulfillment of all of the promises of Abraham. All the promises given to Abraham filled in Jesus, that we were blessed by God to be a blessing to all people. We like to think globally about that, not necessarily individually, but it can't go global until it goes individual. We can't isolate, we can't withdraw, we can't justify our bigotry. We're good Canadians, we, our bigotry, our bigotry is very polite, it's under the surface. It's not really at, well, it's at some people groups, but, but we know we can't say that out loud, but our bigotry is against people, not people groups. Come on. It's a prejudice against people. And here's the thing, we can't be children of a good father if we're not willing to forgive other people. Because to be forgiven by God is to forgive we're isolating ourselves, if we're justifying our sin, if we're individualizing our faith in withdrawal, in a resistance to authority, we step out of the promises of Abraham fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Are you with me? That's why we have to ask some of these tough questions. Are you ready to bury your dad? Are you open to reconciliation? Open to reconciliation with your brothers and sisters? You know why we have to ask those questions? Because we believe that Jesus died for sin and then rose victorious over it. And that as Jesus reconciles us to new life, he always gives us the possibility of reconciliation with one another. And part of living out the resurrection is not being defined by our sin, nor defining others by theirs. It's open to the possibility of forgiveness. So many young Christians come to faith, and uh, they're beautiful. You know, they're so passionate, and they're fired up, and they've got pretty Bibles. And, you know, they just want to read their Bible, and, and they want to get into small groups, and they want to get into mentoring relationships, and it's fantastic. You can just see how real Jesus is to them. And so you start teaching them about Christ, and then you get to this point. If Jesus has forgiven us, we need to forgive others. And some, some get their head wrapped around that, many do not. And many have limited the resurrection power of growing us into being more like Jesus because, because we refuse to forgive others. You may be wondering why Jesus uh, isn't speaking closely, why he doesn't feel near, why... It just seems like you're drifting and not growing. And, and it might be that you've got this one hand raised in worship and this other hand stuffed in your pocket with all the hurt and the pain. And the truth is, is that you're really in denial. There's no worship unless it's both hands open. Unless it's our whole lives surrendered to him. That's part of growing up and maturity. Isaac is moving in those stages, both physically, in his flesh, but also in his spirit. I don't like being alone. There's way too much stress. And way too much responsibility. What's that about? I freaked out last year. We took our family to Scotland. I've taken kids in youth group uh, away and on these trips and been responsible for them. And it never really bothered me because they were other people's kids, you know? 
But when I took my own family, I'm like, if something goes wrong, this is all on me. One of those responsibilities is modeling to one another, to our children, and what it really means to embrace the power of forgiveness in our life. Paul got this, the Apostle Paul. And in one of the most beautiful passages in all of Scripture, in Galatians chapter 4, he says this in verse 29. He says, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham, Abraham's offspring, heirs according to he's saying. Everything that was said to Abraham belongs to you in Jesus. That's what he says. Everything that was said to Abraham belongs to you in Jesus. In verse 26 and 27, he says, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all that last ber- verse <laughs> is not an absolute statement because there still is Jew and Greek. There still is uh, slave and free. There still is male and female. What he is saying, though, is, is in his de-emphasization of that individuality, he's calling us to this greater family, to this more wonderful family, to this more wonderful blessing, that what really matters is that we're sons of God. He even goes so far as to display that. That verse, and we shouldn't miss it, you all in Christ Jesus are sons of God through faith. Now, he's not being chauvinistic. He's just saying, there's no son and daughter. You're all sons. We can get wigged out about that or we can embrace it and just recognize, recognize this, that because we're in Christ's family, we are all equally loved. And we are all equally valued. And we are all equally special. And we are all equal. And so we hold no distinction against anyone. And we embrace no distinction on our own. Because we're all sons through Jesus Christ. That Jesus' blood heals our wounds. That Jesus' blood forgives our sins. That it can do that even in our relationships. That He rose victorious over it. And so we live with this possibility that even those who have hurt us, who shouldn't have hurt us, that even those wounds that are so deep and festering and are infected are not something that need to hurt forever. That when Jesus rose from the dead, He rose with scars on His hand and in His side because that's the power of resurrection. And so we make ourselves available to the possibility, the possibility of reconciliation because Jesus at work in us has reconciled us with the Father and Jesus at work in us can reconcile all relationships. And that, my friends, is a wonderful, wonderful hope. That's the hope. That's a hope that transcends gender. That's a hope that transcends race. That's a hope that transcends life and death. Life and death. Man, if we could just be the most hopeful people in our community, people would be begging us to know the reason for that hope. The reason for that hope? Ah, It's very, very simple. I don't know where you're at. I know how some old some of you are because we've got four generations worshiping here every day. And that doesn't matter either. Those distinctions don't matter because we're all sons of God. What I really want to get across to you today is that those distinctions will just justify our individuality. That anything that identifies us that causes us to withdraw from one another is something that Christ can redeem and wants to redeem. But if we're embracing it, we're not living with the resurrection. We're not being like the original. So I'm going to leave you with those questions. Are you ready to bury your dad? Do you believe in the possibility of reconciliation with your brothers and sisters? And then as we sing, and as we pray, to believe again the forgiveness of Christ for you and the hope that it With our heads bowed, I invite you to pray along with me 
as we allow God into our, into our pain. Our Father God, there's so many ways that we are like the Pharisees. That you know, we look for something to identify with that is less than you as our Father. And Lord, we confess that that has justified our bitterness, our lack of forgiveness, that it has made it very difficult for us to love and be loved by others. And so today, Father, I ask that you would give me the faith to forgive and fill in the blank. I pray, Father, that you would give me the courage to forgive tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Because I believe Because I believe that you've given me hope for your resurrection from that death. Lord, give me the courage to be hopeful in my relationships. And so, our Lord Jesus, we, we would ask that your resurrection power would be at work in our lives through the Holy Spirit. Show us those times where we're trusting in ourselves to, to manage or control our relationships or where we're tempted to withdraw and that we would remember that you never withdrew, that you came close, that you came near. Might we be like Christ in that way towards one another? Might we resist the urge to isolate might we resist the urge to individualize? Might we resist the urge to identify? Identify ourselves by gender, personality, race or religion, profession, socioeconomic class, any of those things. Might we refuse to identify with any of them? Because that's only a slavery, a slavery that you came to break and that you broke 